Hello, my name is Dr. Vicki T. Sapp. I am the Director for Student Engagement, Diversity and Inclusion and Assistant Professor at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. I am here today with my students who attended the Student National Medical Association Annual Medical Education Conference. It was held virtual this year and typically it is an in-person, on-site conference. But this year we went and we attended it virtually from our own homes because we are social distancing because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, what we're going to do is just record our experiences from the sessions we attended. I have a few prompt questions, but we're not gonna follow those per se. We're just gonna have an open flow about what their experience was. So what I'm going to do is allow them to introduce themselves say their degree program, and the first question of why they decided to attend the conference. Whoever wants to go first. Hi, uh, my name is Jesse Lewis. I'm an MBS student at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. Um, I decided to attend the AMEC conference uh, because, well, at first I wasn't going to go after they put it virtual, but uh, Dr. Sapp convinced me because I'm um, in a readings course this summer and I'm writing a research paper and she convinced me that this will help me with my research paper. So, and I'm glad I did go because I learned a lot of new stuff. So. Um, I'll go next. Hi, I'm Stephanie Delma. I'm a first year medical student at Geisinger. Um, I wanted to attend the conference because, well, first I'm an SNMA member and I haven't really been active, so I kind of wanted to see what SNMA was about and I knew I could go to the conference and hear more about it, but um, also I wanted to start making connections with um, Black medical professionals and Black physicians and I knew that there'd be such a huge diverse group attending the conference and I wanted to be um, there to make some connections with people. So my name is Richard Shofaluka. I'm a first year medical student here at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. I wanted to attend the SNMA conference because I don't really know what SNMA is all about. I know in the beginning of the school year through our diversity groups, they have been talking about the conference and the SNMA is a good way to, to collaborate and connect with other black professionals uh, across the country. But I had never had any exposure to that. So I was really excited to try and join that. And especially because it was virtual, they made it, I guess, a lot easier to attend in terms of uh, attending. So yeah, that's from Okay, wonderful. So talk about your experience at the conference. How was it? What sessions you went to? So I had an uh, amazing I guess experience. I can start. Uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> You okay, Richard? Sorry, I'm lagging. I think I'm uh, my internet lagging. is unstable. Yeah. Okay. It's a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> but uh, I would say I really, I loved it, to be honest. I uh, got to meet a lot of amazing people, both students, physicians, residents uh, from all over the country. And I think it was great to really like see these people in all these different fields that like are literally just like me. Um, honestly, I think this is the first time I've seen that many like black physicians or just black like PhD or just really like professional school uh, educated individuals in one place, which was awesome to see. And um, I think I really enjoyed like the virtual aspect of it. I think one, because you could like type in at any moment when you wanted to type and they even let people talk when they wanted to talk. Um, and even like, I guess in terms of like follow-up, I felt like it made things a lot, uh, made people a lot more receptive to like those emails that they were probably getting after. Cause I know after the conference, I sent emails and people got back to me immediately. And even people yeah. sent me emails as well. So it, I that think it is good for people to get back to you immediately. That that's good. And I know, and I think that it also helps that when you're on virtually, you can see the, the face as well as the name of the person. And so it makes you makes it easier for you to actually jot their name down, right? Also in the chat, yeah. they were putting resources and services right in the chat and you can copy it and put it into a Word document. Cause I had multiple screens open and I was copying information. Um, 
yeah, so you all tell me yourself, because I got a lot to say, so I need to shut up and let y'all talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm on the same page as Richard. Um, I also did the same thing where I have so many resources in like one tab of my notes. Um, and I love the conference because um, well, for one, I know that because I want to go into orthopedics and I actually found out during the conference that black women only comprise, I think it's like 0.8% of orthopedic physicians, um, in, yeah, in the United States. And I think she was saying there were only, I think it was 80 of them. No, it must be less than that. But, um, I don't know, just sitting there and like hearing the statistics kind of like blew me away one and two I, I I sat and realized I have never seen a orthopedic surgeon that looked like me but at the conference I was able to talk to multiple of them and it felt so good and I actually asked a question and just said you know like in this um, field it can get a little uncomfortable you know we don't fit the stereotype how do you guys do it or what advice do you have for me and so many of them reached out and they gave me their emails to um, message them and honestly, they just said that there is a group, there's a support group out there, and you do need to, to it's going to be tough. They, they didn't lie to me. <laughs> they said it's going to be a little different, but um, there are people out there that want to help me. And so that just felt really good. Nice. Nice. What about you, Jesse? What sessions did you go to? Why? And what was the experience? I went to mainly uh, pre-medical sessions, so things to help me with, because uh, I'm applying this upcoming application cycle for medical school, so it was mainly things like how to be competitive in your application cycle, how to finance your application, uh, resources, where you can find this thing, these things. Um, I was able to get several mentors. Richard is one of my mentors um, here at Geisinger, but I was able to get many mentors from people across the United States at, at their medical schools now, and um, I've been reaching out like how everyone else I don't have a task I was kind of old school and I wrote down all my notes um because I'm not a fast uh typer um writing is kind of my thing but um yeah I was able to write down people's contact information during this a session called networking I was able to network face to face and had like two minutes I guess or a minute five minutes I'm not really sure of uh, time with a medical student and we're, they're just able to give me like you say nuggets of information mm -hmm. and it was awesome I definitely appreciated them taking their time out to speak to me when they never they don't even know me from a can of paint but it was like they're um they really wanted to just help me get to where they were they are so so it yeah. sounds like you each found um camaraderie you each were, you know, embraced, encouraged, uh, factual information. When you think about, and I, I want you to name some of the sessions. I mean, you're not going to know all the details from the sessions, but let's do a round of, you know, naming some of the sessions. So Jesse named, she went to the um, networking one, right? She went to some pre-med ones. What are some other ones you all went to? Um, I went to one that's called Let's Have a Hair Talk, which is one of my favorite ones, <laughs> and basically just talking about um, what can be deemed as, like, professional hair within the Black community um, and just in, in general, the medical community, and just stories about um, different situations. Some of the physicians talked about being in, in their residencies, which uh, they kind of prepared us for what might be coming in, but they also told us to embrace our culture and embrace who we are. Um, so that we know when we get in there that if someone else says, oh, well, is that professional? Um, you, you kind of question them, well, what is professional to you? Why is that professional? Um, and then I went to another one. I went to ones for kind of matching into residency. So it's called Dominating the Match, where basically we went through the entire application process and the do's and the don'ts of the application process. Um, and the biggest thing that got me was to dig deeper. So no matter what I write down for like my personal statement, always think, okay, what's the next level? How do I get even deeper into that thought? Why do I want to do um, the specialty that I'm applying for? Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about some more, Richard, but I have, I have a ton of them <laughs> I can talk about. <laughs> you want to add to it? Yeah, sure. So I actually didn't. I think it's nice, though. But I didn't attend those sessions. I attended... Uh, one on Saturday, how to choose a medical specialty. 
that was a lot of kind of like figuring out what not only like what you think you like, but knowing how you know that you like that specialty and making sure you're doing what you need to do to uh, prepare yourself for applying to that residency and successfully entering into it. Um, they talked a lot about really when you're on rotations, like think about not just the doctors that you're interacting with or the staff you're interacting with, but the patients as well. And that that experience you're having there won't be representative of maybe the experience that you'll have in residency because every place is different. You might not even be at the same uh, at the same institution once you're in residency. So making sure that you keep an open eye and really realize that this is what you want and it's not because someone else made it fun or someone else also made it bad for you. Um, and then there was one on Sunday as well that talked about excelling in clinical rotations. And I know even though we're still first years, uh, I just thought it was nice to try to look at that and see the type of things that could be done to make yourself a better applicant for residency. Uh, one of the biggest things that I, I, I thought was a great takeaway was they were talking about like feedback and how to really implement your feedback effectively. So a lot of times, like even though like feedback of course is generated into a curriculum where there are people supposed to give you feedback, it's also on you to ask for feedback anytime you think that like you may have done something wrong or you may think that there's something that you've done that could be done better. And then make sure you give yourself enough time to show that you've like improved on those uh, areas that you're weak in so that people know you're making these strides to making yourself a better physician in the future. So I really, uh, I really enjoyed all the sessions I went to. They were, they were great. That's good. So the session that I, um, I went to a number of sessions too, I was just loving it. Sometimes I was flipping between two sessions. I was like, okay, this session is good. This session is good. I'm going to take some nuggets from this one. I'm going to go back and I'm going to take some nuggets from this one. And I just switched back and forth. And that was the best strategy for me. Um, some of them I stayed in the entire time, like affirming care for LGBT communities, because, you know, starting the Safe Zone program at Guy Singer, as well as the Ally program, I wanted to get some more information about transgendered community and understanding that. And so I went to that session. And, you know, one of the things that um, the nuggets that um, Jesse is talking about, I also serve as her mentor this summer for her um, basic research um, course. And so we're going to be working together for eight weeks to develop a paper. Um, and, you know, having that talk with her and understanding that when you're looking at the literature and you're reading stuff, you have to get nuggets from it. So I always talk about these nuggets or these takeaways or the key concepts. And some of the key concepts that I learned from this session was really not being afraid to ask the patient, you know, ask the patient, um, share some stories, um, asking them if it's okay, you know, what is your sex? What is your gender? Share with me. Because as a medical doctor, you need to know that because you're going to prescribe something different based off of how that person identifies and what is their sexual orientation. And so I think that that was very important to get that and to teach the students. It was a lot of students. We had almost 300 students in that session um, and to teach them how to ask the question and not to be afraid. Um, I think that that was the most profound and powerful way um, that um, I forgot his name, Dr. I forgot the presenter's name, but he was talking about when he's practicing medicine and how he does it. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. You know, so that's the session that I went to. I also went to, oh, wait a minute. You know, I have my cheat notes here. <laughs> I also went to clinical rotation training, um, finance and medical school, health inequities, managing stereotype threats and imposter syndrome. I really, really like that one because they gave you an assessment and you have to answer these questions. And so you get your score right at the end and it tells you, you know, do you have imposter syndrome? Everyone has some level of imposter syndrome. Um, and I know that when I was doing my doctoral program, I did. Um, all, through, all through my educational programs, I did. Um, but I scored very low and I was like, oh, really? Now, I do know I have a big head and I'm very confident and I walk and I talk and I do my thing. But I thought I would have some indication of, you know, a higher score, but I didn't. 
And I was like, it could be because I'm done with my degree. I've been in my position for three years. So there's a number of factors you have to um, factor into it as well. If I was just starting in a new community, it may be higher. And so I definitely want to use that. Um, physicians advocacy during COVID-19, I found that to be very, very helpful. Gender and sex disparities, social media. I went to them all. It was awesome. It was awesome. So when you think about the sessions you went to, what are some key takeaways? Yeah, I also went to the um, affirmative care um, talk as well. And I was in the um, gender disparities one for a little bit. So I can't remember which conversation I got this from, but one takeaway I took was not using gendered language. So instead of talking about like, um, like the uterus or something or um, breasts in terms of... That was good, yeah. Yeah, in terms of being like a female a, a attribution just talking about them as organs. So instead of just saying, um, like saying basically like reproductive organs instead of saying what they are, um, just because when we do use gender language, it can um, hurt or even like offend the patients. And that's what something for me, I never even thought about. And so when I heard it, I was just like, oh, wow. Okay. So um, this whole time, like we're using these language and we don't even think about it. And I think that's such a huge privilege. Um, and aside from that, I have to agree just asking the patient. And one thing that I kind of was a little bit worried about was if I asked the patient like, oh, what's your gender? How do you identify if they feel offended? But something that they told us um, as like reassuring is they'll respect that you ask them because you want to learn. Um, and that's what I really liked from that session because I feel like the LGBTQ community is an area that I don't really know that much about. So just being in that session helped a lot. Um, and then also um, the stepping on the step um, seminar, that helped me a lot because I'm really worried about step. Because um, when it comes to standardized testing, it's not, it's not the greatest for me. So uh, there was a representative there from, it's called the PASS program. Mm -hmm. And he works with students all the time. And he basically just said, start early and make a plan. And part of the plan that I liked the most was at the beginning, he was like, you can pray, you can meditate, you do something before you start. And that's how you're going to initiate every time you start your study sessions because it gets you in the mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just starting off slow. So doing like 20 questions and then 30, then 40, then 50 per day. And um, I think even though I don't really have to think about it for like another year or so, mm -hmm. it has gotten me thinking about it. So when the time comes, I won't feel too rushed to get into it. Mm -hmm. And it also gives you a sneak peek, right? Because if there's something that you are very worried about and, you know, it causes some level of anxiety, having a sneak peek or having some information about it could really assist you in alleviating some of that or decreasing some of it because it's like, what's behind the door? What's behind the door? You know, and if you never see what's behind the door, you're always going to be anxious. You know, and I, you know that Amy Klein is our step prep person and we have had very good scores um, when it comes to step on any of the exams. So for every class, you know, every class have done well. And so she will definitely prepare you all. And she tells you, don't think about it. But sometimes yep. it's very difficult. You know, she's like, don't think about it. You don't need to worry about that yet. You don't need to worry about that until you get back from December. And you're like, what? No, 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 no. You know, in your second year. But, you know, they're like, trust the process, trust the process. And so um, I don't think that it hurts to take a sneak peek at it, you know, or to, to start hearing stuff and some strategies, you know. So let's talk about that. What are some strategies, tools, and tips that you all receive some, some, from some of your sessions? Uh, I'll say, I guess, when I went to the professional exhibit hall, it was a lot of, like, resident panels um, and, like, different programs reaching out to students for, like, whatever their interests are. Uh, I went to the Penn URIM resident panel, and during that one, I think I got a lot of keys from this, or a lot of nuggets. Let me, hold on, let me get, get the nuggets in there <laughs> from this one, because um, <clears throat> I like, I like, 
knowing what's ahead in my future. So like, that's why like a lot of my, the sessions I attended were like about like rotations or like uh, in residency. So I asked how like the transition from medical school to residency was for people. And it was a three person panel. Um, but I think one of the big takeaways I took from that was that like in residency, it's, it's a lot less pressure to impress someone rather than like being in medical school on a rotation and it's like yeah actually this is like your job and it's like to save a person's life it can be to save a person's life or just make someone's life quality of your life just a little bit better and if you're able you want to be able to do that to the best of your ability and also be efficient with it as well because if you stay in the clinic all day that's not good for your health either and then that's also not good for the patient's health for whoever you're going to be seeing next so being able to like really learn what you need to do rather than just doing it for like a grade or doing it for to get it done with is was really empowering to me and it made me like it it keeps me like grounded when i'm still in my first and second year doing a lot of studying and like just learning the basics of everything that I, there's always going to be someone that needs help so i really like it uh, I wanted to add uh, some key things I took away took away from the uh, conference, some sessions that I went to. Um, I also like deal with imposter syndrome, as especially like when I'm around um, Caucasians. Like I just, you just in, when you're growing up in grade school, you have the mindset that you know we're kind of like you know African Americans are beneath. So it's like my grade school learning. That's how it kind of was growing up. So it's like every time I get around. Caucasians, it's kind of like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm already beneath, and I, I've been trying to decrease that mindset. That's not healthy. Um, so what I've learned, sorry, it's on my paper. <laughs> I don't know. I said okay. So they said to have realistic goals realistic goals don't compare don't look left don't look right but look up and look within um and to challenge yourself don't come like allow your other people to challenge you it's all about what i set for myself and i was like you're right i need to stop i need to look in the mirror and be like okay this is what jesse's capable of doing if i say i'm capable of doing it i'm gonna do it i'm gonna achieve it it's not what the world uh, what the bar the bar that the world set for me it's what Jessie sets for herself so it it allowed me to do a lot of self reflection um, cuz i'm like i do you know i know Jessie you know we all know ourselves but it's these questions that they <laughs> you know Jessie that's yes. that's Jessie that's Jessie <laughs> questions that they allowed like they asked us to ask ourselves i'm just like dang you know i I don't really know myself. I should also, I should make sure that I have that positive mindset throughout. Um, and I didn't want to add, like, one of the sessions I went to uh, was uh, why choose a historically black medical education program uh, for eight, like for uh, medical school. I graduated from Florida a and University, which is an HBCU last year. And I was thinking about um, going to HBCU for medical school, but I'm just like, you know, divert, maybe I should go somewhere more diverse. Maybe I should uh, get away from just, you know, only black people. But going to that session, I was like, you know, sometimes, you know, black Americans have you know, they're, they're just your support system. And like, I was so in tune with it. And while making my list for applying to medical schools, I actually added um, the HBCUs because I'm just like, honestly, I need to make sure that my list is diverse. And it, it actually prompted me to buy this shirt. <laughs> this, um, <laughs> this HBCU. You're just, just buying like, stuff. Okay, you got to put it out there. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? Yeah, I have a guy singer one as well because you know, you know, it <laughs> but um, S O M D S O M. Yes, yes, but yeah, I definitely learned a lot from those sessions. Yeah, you know what? You you touch on some key things. You know, when people are thinking about, and one of the things that I tell students, and I just want to be honest, is that you know everybody can't get into the um, historically black colleges and university medical schools, right? And you really may want to look at a PWI because you may get a lot of funding because they're looking for diversity. You want to use that as your tool, um, your anchor to be able to say, I am strong. I'm a strong candidate. 
They're going to pay for me to go. I have the grades. I have the intellect. I have the MCAT scores. Why not? Why not? When we begin to talk about reparations and what our um, ancestors have contributed to America, yeah, why not? You know, they're not looking at people who are not qualified. They're not letting people in. So, you know, to dispel those type of myths, you still have to have the grades. You still have to have the MCAT scores, you know, and that's why, you know, I do what I do in my office is to make sure that you are engaged, involved, and connected, and figuring out which ways in which that can happen. It's not going to be tailored to everyone, you know, and that's why I'm very, I try to be very inclusive in the programmatic initiatives that I do, because we all have culture. So let's all celebrate that, right? But also when we take it to the classroom and we begin to look at the professional identity formation of cultural humility, competency curriculum that we can explore some of that stuff there. We don't have to do it all the time, but that we do have some type of space where we are examining these concepts. And for some people, it's the first time they're hearing about microaggressions. It's the first time they're hearing about examining privilege and, you know, things like that. So how do we at least put it on their radar so that they could at least begin to understand that because they're going to be working in a profession with everyone. And so introducing them to that and then leveraging the, the skill sets that you have because you are, this is your lived experience to leverage that voice, to bring it to the classroom so that they can hear those real stories. And so really working with you all when we're presenting this curriculum, for some, it's the first time they're even hearing it. And then for you all to be able to share your lived experiences so that they can really understand how to put the concepts together is very important. So I would say, yes, a historically black college and university, great. But don't, don't sleep on the P, T, PWIs because they may offer the most funding. You know, everyone can't go to a um, historically black college and university, but you can get an education. Is it and I always ask students, is it important for you to go to a historically black college or um, university medical school, or is it important for you to be a doctor? And they're like, well, you put it that way. I, I want to be a doctor. Okay. You know, and then when you're on campus, you're on campus for two years. You can do anything in two years. And then you go out into your clinical experience. And your clinical experience, no matter what school you go to, is going to be the reality of what your experience is going to be like as a doctor. So learning to navigate those spaces early on are going to be very important and equipping you with the tools to be able to do that. Hey, Dr. Sepp, can I add something real quick to that? Because I remember this was also in the Penn resident panel, but uh, one of the things that those physicians said was that they really chose Penn because they wanted to see people like like them in those powers of position, in those positions of power that could influence that type of thing. So like they wanted people that they knew actually like, or they wanted an institution that they knew actually cared about uh, those like reparations, I should say, for lack of a better word, uh, making sure that people are in the position to say, okay, we need to do better here where we're not actually addressing the inequalities and the social determinants of health within the communities that we actually serve. So I think that was something that really opened my eyes into not just like going towards a residency just because I like it, but also like where you actually go can play a big factor in like who is in those positions of power that's able to influence the curriculum and what you see, what you do, and what you learn on a daily basis. So yeah, I like that you brought that up. Yeah. yeah, and another strategy too, because I, I was also in the stereotype threat talk for a little bit, and I saw you typing in the comment box, Dr. Sam. I did? Um, um, one of the strategies was storytelling, and I think you did mention that a little bit. Um, and they did a study on um, how students who were at the school um, wrote basically about how they felt like they didn't belong, but how they slowly started to feel like they belo belonged at the school. And they recorded it and played it for um, the incoming class. And they saw that as they kept doing this process, the grades of students was were increasing because they were feeling less of like the um, imposter syndrome or like stereotype threat because they kind of had that back, 
like that hope in the end that they're going to start belonging in the community, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was amazing. And then on top of it, another thing that you can do, which is kind of brushing on what Richard just said, is just having more representation within the institutions. Mm -hmm. um, because I think overall, something that kind of stuck with me in that talk is the idea that, um, I forget the word is, but basically distancing, distancing yourself from the stereotyped group. And I feel like I've, I've definitely done that in undergrad and um, looking back at like my performance in undergrad and how I personally felt, you could see that I was missing something and it's almost like you let go of this identity. And I think, especially when applying to medical schools, that's the one thing I always um, made a key point was that I'm starting to know who I am and I'm really like in touch with my identity and my culture. My family's Haitian and I love everything about my culture. We got a really rich culture. So after doing that, I think especially too, medical schools are like, wow, this girl really knows what who she is or who she's trying to become and appreciates that. And I think that's something that we can all bring to um, any institution that we're going into. But um, I think that's one, another strategy is just trying to figure out how we can find our identities and, um, I think that can boost all of our confidence or, you know, hopefully combat the stereotype threat and imposter syndrome. Because I, I scored really poorly on, not poorly, but I had a high level. I think it was like 80 for the, the test mm -hmm. at the end. And that kind of scared me because I thought I was a little over that. But. Mm -hmm. but you know what, like I said, when you look at that test, you have to look at, you are a first year medical student. In your first year, it's so much now with COVID-19, forget about it. But, you know, it's so much uncertainties, right? And you don't know, and you're halfway in, halfway out. You're still trying to belong. You're still trying to find yourself. And so you have to take in those factors as well. One of the great things I liked about that session is that it doesn't matter where you score. There's ways in which you can manage it. It's not a bad thing that you scored that high. It's now you know, you are aware of it, and you can uh, incorporate things to manage it, to really begin to put it on your radar, to reflect. And just a little bit that you said right now with, you know, my identity. Now I know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm strong in it. I appreciate it. I'm Haitian. And stop, I say, like, what are we talking about here? You know, and so, you know, really embracing that, and I was able to find that in college, you know? So that's why when I walk in the room, I don't apologize. I am unapologetically who I am. If everyone else could walk up in here and be in their existence, I'm not trying to outshadow anyone. I'm not trying to be a rainbow bright. I'm not trying to take anybody else's um, zing from them, but I am, I'm clear on who I am. And I walk into that, wherever I am. I have a right to be here just like everyone else. And who's going to tell me different? And that's, that's the way that I just walk around in life. And if I don't know stuff, I ask questions. My success has nothing to do with your success. If we both succeed, that's great. That's what the goal is. And that's how I carry myself. And I've done that since undergrad. And I'm just like, we all can succeed. We can help each other. Let's study. Let's do this. Let's do that. I'm always sharing information. And I've been like that forever. Let's, my success is your success. And if I know who I am, that's the best thing about, I, nobody's going to tell me who I am and who my people are. I know that information. You know, I'm teaching you, you know, so and understanding that we all can teach each other and we're co-constructing knowledge together. You know, we're co-constructing the knowledge together. And we're talking about factual stuff. Y'all can keep that other stuff. I need to know about facts. What are the facts? What's the research? What is the history? Because if you do not know history, you will repeat it. So I'm just passionate about this, I guess. <laughs> Just a tad, just a tad. <laughs> because I believe that everyone needs to have a sense of belonging. We need to embrace everyone. You're all medical students. You're going to be friends forever if you create these interpersonal relationships and you all have a respect and you extend olive branches and understand that you come from so many different walks and um, experiences of life and just embrace that and 
and just go with it. You know, that's how I feel. We can all do this together, but you need to understand that there are certain things that has happened in my history. You're not going to ignore that. And that we got to look at policies and procedures because it's systemically inequitable. So how do we break down those inequitable practices? How do we even examine it, you know, to be say, to say, this is not right. We need to do something different, you know? So really examining those. And I think that at Geisinger, they have really been trying to meet me halfway. It has been a struggle because if you don't see it, you don't see it. So I have to figure out different ways to show them and to give them the examples. But I also know that I have to wait until they're ready to be there, you know, because I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. We should have already been there already. But you have to figure out how to present that information to people so that they can make the change that needs to be made. So. So what would you all recommend? Um, who should go to the conference? What would you recommend? Why should they go? You know, if you were speaking to administrators and pitching this um, to them, what would you say to assist them with understanding why um, or why not folks should go to the conference? Well, uh, I would say I think that people should come here. Well, I being an MBS student, um, if this were, we're talking about like Geisinger, right? Okay, yeah. So um, the people, students in the MBS, especially if you're first generation, um, I think that you should go to the AMET conference because it's something that will allow you to see that you're not the only one in your situation, not the only one that's applying to medical school. You don't have to do this process alone. There are other resources out, outside of Geisinger that you can get and um, be able to apply to yourself to other help like bring back the information to other people um being a first generation navigating you know this path to medical school is pretty hard sometimes but um like Geisinger gave me Richard so I'm like Richard helps me and I'm just like you know what Richard's telling me I can go tell somebody else like this is what AMEC will allow you to do um so I really think that MBS students first gen students uh minorities should definitely take the opportunity to go to Amen. Yeah, I feel like I, I, because I put made notes before and I put M1s to M3, but I feel like M4s could definitely benefit from it as well. But like, there were so many resources for almost every step of the way of medical school. And I feel like people, I don't know, someone has always told me like, if someone or else else has already gone through it, you should really ask them for their advice because then you avoid making unnecessary mistakes or taking the long way around things um, and you can get to where you need to go in an easier way. And I think that's exactly what happened. Like I feel so much more prepared for what's going to come up in the next years. Even thinking about clinical years is little nuggets like everyone's saying that I'm going to implement. I'm going to come not just on time but early to all my clinical rotations. Hope God willing. <laughs> um, so I think anybody, yeah, any medical student honestly would benefit from going to this, but especially if I have to be very specific, I think any minoritized group of people, because I do think that um, there's a sense of community that you can build and that's, that's found there. And it, if you don't already have that community within your institution, I think that this conference helps you figure out ways to bring that there. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'll probably just echo Steph's comments because I think anyone can really attend this con conference. Uh, there are so many, there's so much new information that you can learn that it doesn't like, you don't even, you don't have to be black to attend. You can be an advocate or an ally and learn something that you can now bring back to your home institution to help uh, advocate for your fellow students. Um, even the things that I talked about earlier, like those things weren't just pertaining to me because I'm black, like those are things that you should be able to do because you're gonna be a doctor and you're gonna have to learn how to navigate this world as you continue through medical school. So being able to do it, and I think at least if you are gonna go, try and go as early as possible, I think. Cause I think now being a first year, this helps me like, I guess conceptualize what I wanna do. And I do wanna go back next year, but now it's gonna help me say, okay, since I've done these things this year, what can I do next year that will help me 
learn new information so I don't really just go through the same thing again. So I think if you have a chance, even like they have the pre-med side of it too that Jesse was able to go to. So as early as you can get in, go ahead and go for it and just try to learn something new every single year that you do choose to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm part of a sorority. So we have um, high school students and they're interested in pre-med. Um, and so they're interested in medicine. And so I even gave it to them. I was like, for $139, this is a steal. I mean, you can't get this anywhere. When you think about if we had to go in person, the hotel room, the travel, the meals, the conference registration, you know, and it also allowed me to look on online and see that membership for students is $104. Y'all could come up with $104 to be a member. I mean, like, I was just like, wow, I didn't even know that. I know how much it costs for faculty and staff. But I was like, when I saw it for a student, and it could be all relative, right? You're like $104. That's kind of a lot of money, Dr. Sapp. Um, but I was just like, it's only $104. And I was like, wow, you know, for, for people to have access to this information, um, they have an app, you know, and they give out information. They have webinars. They have talks. I mean, these, this is when you, when you talk about knowledge is power. This knowledge is just awesome just to be, and, it's when, and you know, Jesse spoke about being first generation and that is so important. I'm the three time first generation undergrad, grad and my doctoral program. And when I think about if I had known any of this information ahead of time, what I could have done with it. I mean, you could be, knowledge is power you know, you could be so far ahead of the game and it, it allowed me to reflect back. And I was like, I was always behind the eight ball when I was in undergrad, you know, being a psychology major, not that many people of color in psychology, especially when we got to the higher level courses. And then I'm always wondering to myself, like, I don't understand why I keep, why am I getting eight? So my imposter syndrome was I did so well and I thought that they were passing me through. You know, and I'm like, why am I getting A's in this? I don't see, it, it was like people were just dropping. You know, every time I advanced in the course, they are dropping out. I started taking graduate courses while I was an undergrad. People are just missing. What happened? What happened to the people? You know, and it, it really, you know, you begin to do that stereotype threat, racial battle fatigue, imposter syndrome, and you begin to understand these concepts and you just keep pushing forward. You know, you just got to keep pushing forward. And so really understanding that it is for everyone. You know, at the end, if you are a pre-med student and you get into med school, they celebrate you. It's a big celebration. It's like coming back to, um, to Africa type of celebration. It is awesome, mm -hmm. you know. And I was just like, this is awesome. And they give you a stall. They give you a stall. So I was like, oh, well, I do that for my first gen celebration, you know? And then when you're grad, when you're done in your fourth year and you're moving on to your residency, I mean, it was awesome the way they proceeded in and people had on big hats and outfits. And I was like, I feel like I'm coming. It was beautiful, you know, and just to celebrate uh, the students for, you know, getting into med school or even getting into their residency. They pick people to come up and put the soul on. I don't know if y'all know Satanya Doug Douglas, but she, she was like, Dr. Sapp, I want you to come up and put my soul on. And I'm like, what am I doing? And so she was like, you'll see, you'll see, because she got into medical school. She's a former um, GCSOM um, on, uh, graduate student. And so it was all this big to do. And I'm looking like, oh, okay, all right. And then she's like, come up here. <laughs> and, you know, I went and put her stole on. And I was just like, wow, this is all. I mean, she was crying. And it, she was like, oh, my goodness, it's so emotional. And I was like, it really is emotional, you know. But it was beautiful. And to be able to have that community, you know, Stephanie and Richard, you continuously talk about community and having that community. And these are going to be your colleagues far and near, 
you know, throughout your life, you would probably have these individuals before you can see someone who looks like you, depending on where your residency is going to be. And then also when you begin to start practicing. And so having that connection early on, I'm going to have to agree with you. It's very, very important. Very, very important. And that was going into my next question, was asking about um, the SNMA and maps and, you know, what experience you have. And if you don't have an experience, what experience would you like to get from your membership in those organizations if you decide to do it? Yeah, I have a membership right now for SNMA. And like I said before, I haven't really used it much, but after the conference and during the conference, I kept scrolling through all the the pages on their website and they have a lot to offer. Like there's a region for each, I think few states, they split us up into regions. We're region eight. Our region does a lot of stuff. And so I can just imagine like the connection students are already making with other medical students um, within the region. So that's one thing I was actually um, talking to Richard about it a little bit is that I, I mean, I would hope we could be able to have a chapter at Geisinger. I don't know what the steps are to take in um, to do that, but... Um, Faye is going to be a, a entering first year, and she's already looking into that, so you all need to connect with her, because she's looking into that, because the year before last, we won Region 8 national and local awards at the conference. We were doing it, you know, and then we had a break, and so Faye is going to be a first year, and she's already interested in moving forward with that, so I think that you all are probably going to have a good representation again. That would be that would be amazing. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely excited. Like, I really want to reach out and start connecting more with everyone across the board. Um, I know that I haven't. I'm not a member, so I don't really know what to expect. But like Steph said, I went through the website and I'm trying to figure out what ways that we can implement SNMA here at Geisinger. And I, like, I it 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 basically just rejuvenized me. I don't know if that if any better way to say it, like it makes me want to reach out and do all these efforts to try and learn, meet new people and learn new things about them. And it's, it's because like, honestly, this stuff is hard. Like, I know we say it all the time, but like, once you, when you actually are going through it, like some things are really hard and to be able to have that type of community to fall back on and to have people always in your corner rooting for you can be such a huge difference in how and what you, and how you succeed throughout your career. So I'm definitely want to, get into uh, connecting with the region eight, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to connect as well. <laughs> I, won't, I won't have a school after I graduate in June, but um, definitely wherever God leads me, I definitely want to be a part of it for me. I do want to join as a student, but like you said, a hundred four dollars, um, but you know, I'm not rich, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to make sure that I put the money aside in this next refund check um, to join as a member. Mm -hmm. I think it would be very, very beneficial to join, to tap into the resources, to use that. I know because we haven't had a critical mass um, the two, two years ago when we were um, members of Region 8, that um, Temple University took us under their wing. So they became the parent um, SNMA to the MBS maps, right? Because the MBS students were really running it and we didn't have a critical mass for SNMA. And so Temple took us under their wing and we went there a few times. Like I drove the students there, we got a van and I drove them there so that they can connect with them um, so my office is always willing to do whatever we need to do to get you all engaged and to assist you with creating that community. Yes, you'll have community at um, GCSOM and that's to be expected, but we also need to realize having that cultural um, person of color type of connection is just different and needed. And that's why I hold the sessions on Fridays at 5.30, students of color chat with Dr. Sapp because of this whole COVID-19, you know, so that you can let your hair down and you don't have to wear a mask and you can just talk about whatever. You know, sometimes people just sit and listen and that's fine too, but some things may come up and so you may want to talk about it. Things may not come up. We only have, what, two more sessions left? 
you know, and I'll check in to see if students want to continue it. But, you know, just to be there, just to have that space, you know, that non-judgmental, you don't have to wear a mask, you don't have to explain some things, you can just say it and people just get it. You know, that's always, always important to have that um, space. No, no, nothing against, no shade against anybody else, but we're on all the time, 24 seven, we're on. And there's just some spaces where we need to be off and we just need to talk. You know, so anything else you want to say just for the good of the order, anything I didn't cover that you want to just throw out there? You mentioned um, COVID-19 um, and I wrote down something because I attended the COVID-19 and advocating during a pandemic crisis mm -hmm. and he was saying uh, that we should want to make a difference be a part of what is going on, not just sit on the sidelines and just watch hopelessly. And before the conference, this is when I decided to write about um, COVID-19 and the African-American community. And when he said that, I'm like, this is honestly what is driving me to write this paper. So mm -hmm. I definitely want to be an advocate for uh, the African-American community during this time. Because mm -hmm. like now it's shining a light on our healthcare disparities that's always been here but now it's like now they want to pay attention to it so yeah and one of the things that I also say is um we can sit back and look and judge but we need to take action we need to be involved we need to figure out uh what levels we want to be involved and what's our comfortability but then we also need to step out of that and we need to be a little bit uncomfortable to be able to take action. And it's never too late to take action. You know, you think about it and you be like, I wish I would have did this, or I wish I would have said this. Oh, trust me, I go back. Like, remember that conversation we were having and you said X, Y, and Z? I need to uh, circle back around to address that. Because I mean, if you never address it, the person is walking around believing whatever. And you know, and I always say, when did the offense happen? Did it happen when I said something to you or when you said something to me? And so really figuring that out and um, approaching to educate, because I'm always trying to educate. I'm not trying to beat up on people, but I'm like, I don't know if you know this, but that statement is very questionable, you know, and that belief or that action or, okay, if you're going to do this, how is it going to impact the students of color first generation, LGBT community, people with accessibility needs. Have we thought about that? And that's what I do in meetings. I just ask those questions. This is great that we're doing this. How is it gonna impact those marginalized communities? How are we gonna do that? You know, even to simple, uh, uh, the Halloween event that happens, the, the Steamtown Health Fair event that happened, the turkey trot event that happens. Are we sending this out in different languages? How are we getting those people onto campus? And all I did was ask the question. Sometimes you have to be the one to ask the question, you know? And it's and I always pose it as a question. I'm not attacking. I'm not, um, I, do we have this in different languages so that we can get those communities on campus? Because if we say we're here for the community, they're part of the community. What community are we talking about? And so sometimes you can lead with just asking a question instead of being accusatory or saying, y'all not even thinking about this or y'all not even. Do we have it in other languages? What are we doing about that? Oh, we can't order food from outside, but we have diverse people who go to school here. How are their needs being met? Do all of them eat what the cafeteria serve? I don't think they do we're gonna to have to do something different. We're gonna to have to go out to the businesses and allow us to order food from different cultural backgrounds. And our mission also says that we uh, impact the community and we embrace the community. And I think that these small businesses that we are buying the cultural foods from will really appreciate that. And it will show that we are community-based in a number of different ways. So it's really, how are you interpreting the policies and the procedures? And then who's included and who who's not? 
And what questions are you asking? And so when you think about that and how you navigate spaces and how you're going to navigate your third year um, going into the clinical space and you begin to see stuff that is not equitable or people are being left out, sometimes the question is, sometimes the response is asking a question to even get them thinking about it. Once they start thinking about it, they'll start coming up with a whole bunch of stuff, you know, even people. And that's why I always say we need our allies. Even allies are start coming up with stuff and start saying stuff and start telling you, you know. And so I'm like, okay, well, this is what you should do. I have a lot of meetings with faculty and staff in my office because they feel like something is inequitable. And they don't know how to go about it. And so I help them, equipping them with the tools to be empowered, you know? And that's why I always tell the students of color, you don't have to just come to me. There's so many faculty and staff who are allies. Trust in it. Say something to them. They will help you. And plus, I'm only one person. I'm only one person. But they will help you, you know? So really doing different things like that to be able to, um, have voice, right? And impact stuff and saying stuff. I mean, and students, you all have so much power. Oh my goodness. I don't even understand why y'all don't know this. So much power, you know, they couldn't shut me up in undergrad or my grad program or my doctoral program. I was the president of everything. The president of the student government and undergrad in my grad program because I knew I had power. And I knew that I'm coming to the, I want to speak to the president. What's going on? This is, these are the concerns and these are the things that we want. And they're like, okay, <laughs> like, thank you very much. And so knowing that you have voice and you have power in this space right now and being able to use that is going to be very important to you all. Very. We have one minute left. Anybody else want to talk? Because I can talk all day. <laughs> Uh, really quick, I'd just like to say I want to thank you, Dr. Sapp, as well as Dr. Castro, for funding us to be able to attend this event. It honestly took the words out of my mouth. Like, you equipped us with the power to learn these things and come back again and share it with our community so that we can grow and be better. So, I really do appreciate that in both of your offices. So, thank you very much you for giving us the opportunity. You are welcome. I agree with Richard. Um, I'm almost sad that the rest of our classmates and peers can experience this. So I really hope that, I don't know who, who this video goes out to, but I hope if they see it, that they do come because it, it was a great, great experience. It's gonna go out to your membership. That's what the, you were supposed to have a meeting with your membership. So it's gonna go to your membership. So once- that would be good. <laughs> yes, once, once we finish this, you're gonna draft something, put something together and send it out to your membership. But I think I need to send it to Brian Krause to cut out that 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 beginning part. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah. We can. <laughs> and I see that on the bottom, there's pause and stop, and I didn't even think to do that. But we'll have <laughs> Brian cut it. We'll have him cut that part out, and then thank we'll you, thank lose you. Lose it over. <laughs> okay, well that's all of our time. Thank you all so much, and um, have a great weekend. Make sure you stay healthy and safe. Thank you, Dr. Sad. Thank you. You too. Welcome. Enjoy the weekend. You too. Bye bye.